Hi everyone, I'm Dre, the host and founder of the Dragon Network, an online community where health IT professionals share experiences and discuss ideas with one another as they relate to healthcare technology. For today, I wanted to go over one of the most common project management methodologies that's utilized in healthcare IT, and that is the waterfall model. So the waterfall method of project management is what's called a linear sequential lifecycle model, and it's based on some process concepts that were used in manufacturing and construction industries. It was first formally documented in 1970 by an individual by the name of Dr. Winston Royce. There are some concepts that go back as far as the 1950s that discuss this same linear sequential type approach, but this is the first time that most people credit with it actually being written down and logically sort of articulated. When that was done, there were six phases outlined and those were the requirements analysis, design, development, testing, and operations. We typically tend to follow seven phases now, and you will see sort of a variety of different documentation that ranges between five and seven phases. So what does linear sequential mean? That the project is broken down into distinct subphases, and that those subphases need to be completed in a sequence. So before the next phase can start, the previous phase has to be completed. Linear sequential also indicates that you can't uh, sort of loop back regularly. So once you've completed a stage and moved on to the next, you continue along that linear sequence. You don't have the ability to go back and revisit and, and sort of do that. If you do, you need to start again. So the waterfall model that I typically see in a healthcare IT space and that I personally tend to work off of does contain those seven phases like I mentioned earlier. The additional phase that gets added in frequently is the deployment phase or implementation. In the original document, there wasn't a separate phase for deployment. It just went from testing straight to operations. Because in a healthcare space, our IT projects or really any of our projects have such a huge impact on workflow. There's often a lot of activity that occurs with cutovers and often that very short warranty period as well. So that's why I've added in the seventh one. We'll dive into the seven phases that I typically tend to utilize for the waterfall approach. I've grouped them into three different sections and these are really broken down just for my own purposes. I tend to find it easier to sort of work in smaller chunks and to sort of really understand and document things sort of wrapped up in these. So the three groupings that I typically utilize is group one, which includes the requirement, the analysis, and the design. The group two is where you've got the build and testing activities, and then the group three is where you deploy and move to support and operations. So let's take a look at group one. So in the requirements phase, you want to collect the information from the business and all of your project stakeholders, and this is what's going to be used to define the outcome goals for the project have a clear documented intention for the project. You wanna know exactly what it is that you're looking at and you wanna make sure that you clarify what is in scope from a functionality perspective as well as from a purchasing perspective. Throughout the requirements phase, you need to make sure project, IT leadership, business all are on the same page. So you don't want to be misaligned from the beginning. It will just cascade and cause you problems later. The other thing that you want to make sure is that you recognize that you're going to have a fairly heavy input or a fairly heavy lift when it comes to your subject matter experts and your business stakeholders. So the other things that you need to keep in mind is that during the requirements phase, when you are documenting that information and when you're using the detail for the goals, that they can't be open-ended. They actually need to be concrete and they need to be defined. If you don't define them in the requirement stage, you're going to struggle in the analysis and the design phase. So once you've completed the requirements and you do have a defined scope, the team is going to get together and start to brainstorm and really work through ideas on how you can deliver these outcomes. So you need to understand for the analysis phase current state because you're going to need to know where the gaps are and where you need to focus your attention. You also need to take a look at the regulatory uh, review. So is there any regulations, any organizational policies, any best practice guidelines that you need to incorporate? So make sure you're doing a scan of those in this analysis phase. Document all of your options and document the options uh, that are rejected or declined as well. So this is going to help you from a communication perspective, from a transparency perspective, understand sort of later on or in years to come sort of why you didn't go with an option that may have been on the table at the time. 
Throughout this entire analysis stage, of course, it is key to make sure that the appropriate individuals are included in the discussions. So you want to keep your design process really aligned with your analysis, but in your analysis phase, you want to make sure you've got all your stakeholders there. If you don't, if you leave out some key stakeholders, then you're going to run the risk in the design component of having sort of people pop up out of the woodwork and say, wait a second, we forgot this and we forgot that, which doesn't uh, tend to work very well with a waterfall model. So the last uh, phase in group one is the design phase. In this design phase, that's where you're going to take the viable options out of the analysis phase and you're going to investigate them further and really do a deep dive and create some detailed design and architecture documents that you'll work off of for your build phase. So system functionality needs to be included along with workflow and process steps. So this design phase usually results in a lot of process mapping documents as well as your build specs. Before you move to the next phase, you need to make sure that the design documents are signed off. These are going to be referred to over and over again, and in particular throughout the testing phase. So group number two typically has the bulk of the activity, so it's in the 30 to 40 percent of the total project range. And in group two, I typically just include the coding of the build as well as the testing and QA rounds. The build phase follows that sign off of your uh, design documents. And it's really where these specification documents and all this design work is going to be incorporated into the appropriate system or into the appropriate technical environment. It includes install of any new infrastructure, any new application modules that are come online, all of your software configuration, really anything that requires hands-on keyboard effort to make your project come alive, if you will. You also will need to be cognizant that there's additional documentation that's going to occur throughout this phase and it's really to support your subsequent testing and deployment phases. You also will typically include some unit testing. Testing in QA phase is often reserved for the heavier lift testing. The final thing in this uh, coding and build area that you want to make sure you stay cognizant of is that you need to stick to the requirements and you need to stick to the scope. So once you've completed the build and the build team or the application and technical teams have signed off that they're finished, you're going to move over to the testing phase. So the activities that are tested must align with the documented requirements and the intended outcomes. So the testing and QA team is also going to refer back to what those requirements were and what that uh, design specification document looked like. The testing QA phase is going to involve functional testing, which is internal to the application but across modules. Integration testing, which is of course through connected systems performance testing in some cases, so not all projects will go through performance testing, and then you also uh, may want to have user acceptance testing. Again, that will depend on the size of the project. Group number three is the remainder of the timeline, and this involves the deployment, and again, that's one that uh, gets typically added in from a healthcare perspective, but wasn't in the original model, and operations, which is your support and maintenance. The deployment phase, like I mentioned, is, is typically added in because there is such significant impact to our users and in order to successfully deploy things we need to involve quite a bit of planning and effort. So the activities can slightly overlap with your uh, testing. So you can begin your planning activities and you can begin some of your training initiatives and things like that while you're still in your final QA and testing phase. This is one where there could be a little bit of overlap you most certainly can't go to full deployment until you've completed your testing. So you do need your testing to be complete, all your defects to be resolved or your critical defects to be resolved before you can deploy. The deployment phase, as it's typically rolled out in Waterfall for health IT, is it includes uh, operational and support team training. So you want in your deployment phase to have some very detailed documentation on what's going to happen for cutover. This includes not only the technical and application side of cutover activities, but it also includes the business side. So especially in a hospital that's running 24 by 7, you do want to understand sort of when the cutover activities or when the downtime occurs. What are users supposed to do? What do they do leading up to it? What do they do during the actual deployment? Um, and then what do they do immediately after for reconciliation? All of that needs to be in this deployment phase and it all needs to be documented and detailed so it can be communicated. Operations is a separate and distinct phase. So the project does include activities in the operations phase before it's considered wrapped up with waterfall. It's not just a we went live, I get to walk away. Support and maintenance is often subdivided into two different phases or two subphases. 
and that is a warranty and an ongoing support or ongoing operation. During the warranty phase, it's really hyper support. So you have more people focused on fixing issues quicker. You have a support turnaround time that is a lot more attentive to your end users. What you're going to do is you're going to fix any issues that are discovered. They're typically tracked in an incident management tracking system. You're going to also address any significant workflow issues that are a result. You also want to make sure you're incorporating regular performance review activities for anything new ongoing. So to make sure that you incorporate those things into your technical uh, standard maintenance activities. So that will also occur here and that you want to make sure that the standard operating procedures and new hire training is all up to date, documented, you retrospectively look back and make any changes you need to. So that in a nutshell, is what the waterfall methodology is or the waterfall model is from a project management perspective. 